So welcome again um, to the um, Education Committee webinar on quality assurance, quality control for energy modeling. Today's uh, format is a panel discussion. So we have four excellent uh, panelists um, together here. Uh, Maria Karpman from Karpman Consulting, Eileen Rockwell, uh, HKS, John Han, University of Strathclyde in uh, Glasgow, and Greg Collins from Zero Envy. My name is Oliver Baumann, uh, Baumann Consulting. I'm moderating um, the seminar today, and I'm also um, on the education committee of Ibiza USA. If you want to support Ibiza USA, please become a member. I'm pretty sure based on the number of registrations that we had for today's webinar, that um, at least some of you are not yet a member. Please consider doing so. Here's the contact information, either the web link or an email to membership at ibiza.us. The program today, um, you read that here already but, uh, when you registered for the seminar. Um, so I'm not going through that in detail. What we want to achieve today in that seminar is to give a general update where we as the, the panelists think the quality assurance, quality control process for energy modeling um, is today and what might be missing and how we get to a stage where quality assurance and quality control for energy modeling becomes a business as usual and is an established process so that our uh, clients and the, the project partners that we work with as energy modelers can rely on the results that they get and on the information and more make informed decisions. Um, we do quick introductions here. Um, so I stop share and let the panelists um, introduce themselves. Maria, would you go first, please? Yes. Hey, everyone. Uh, very excited to be a panelist in this uh, event hosted by IBIPSA. Uh, model quality control is the topic that um, I care a lot about. Um, I started my career as software developer. I worked on developing interface to um, uh, Sunreal calculation engine. Uh, then I shifted my focus to uh, developing energy models for new and existing buildings. Most of these models were for projects that participated in utility incentive programs. So that got me involved in developing technical requirements for the incentive programs and uh, reviewing submittals to these programs. And uh, then from there, I got involved with developing uh, the standards that drove uh, oftentimes requirements of these programs, including um, Standard 90.1, so I'm now a committee member of Standard 90.1 and also ESHRAE Standard uh, 140. So, and I'm also a principal of uh, consulting practice, carbon consulting, and we are based in Connecticut. Okay, thank you, Maria. John? Okay, um, I get to wear lots of different hats. Someday I wake up and I'm a software developer. I've made a couple of thousand commits to the open source program ESBR. Some days I wake up, I'm a consultant. And the first thing I think about is how I'm going to help the client. And some days I wake up and what I'm doing is checking other people's models. And some days I wake up and I run uh, courses teaching practitioners how to be passive house consultants. Um, and I'm the official paranoid guy in our group. Uh, and I've been around IPIPSA for rather a long time. Okay, thank you, John. Colleen? Hi, uh, I am a senior sustainable design engineer at HKS, as well as a licensed architect. Uh, so HKS is a global architecture firm. And then prior to joining HKS, I did work for a consulting engineering firm. So I feel like I have a pretty good grasp of kind of both those worlds. Uh, but my role at HKS at least within the scope of energy modeling, because I do also wear a lot of hats, is to run energy models throughout the design phases of our projects. And that can range from early phase to compliance modeling. And right now we have three people in our firm who has this type of skill set. 
serving over 75 million square feet of our portfolio. So a large part of my role that I'm focusing on today is training our architects and designers to run energy models themselves. Um, as well as being the, the reviewer of models that we get from third-party consultants. Okay, thank you, Kylie. And Greg? Uh, hi, everybody. I'm Greg Collins. Uh, I'm the founder and principal of Zero Envy. Um, so we've been in operation since 2016, providing energy modeling, building performance analysis, and consulting for projects for owners, architects, uh, MEP engineers, sustainability consultants. Um, we also do some like hourly technical support and, and coaching uh, for people that you know need a little extra help. So all we do is energy modeling, um, and that's been primarily what I've done for my whole career. I guess going on well, 12 years now. Um, and then I'm also the chair of the IBEPSA USC committee that's focused on California uh, BIM practitioner advocacy, um, kind of a mouthful there, but uh, that's a relatively new uh, committee. Um, and then I have been on the lead energy and atmosphere tag um, for about five years. I was the chair last year. Uh, and Kylie's on that, on that committee as well. Um, and yeah. Looking forward to sharing some of our QA, QC processes today. Okay, thank you very much. So you all see we have a quite impressive panel together. Um, the format will be that um, every panelist has about five to seven minutes for a statement presentation. Uh, we'll take questions after that in the second part of the seminar. If you have uh, questions, please put them in the chat area and we will and facilitate the, the Q&A in the second half. Since we introduced ourselves now, we would like to know a little bit more about the audience. By now we have almost 200 people um, on, on this uh, seminar here. So that's, that's excellent. And we prepared two uh, quick polls. And Mike, I would like you to bring up the first one. So this is about your role in regard to energy modeling. We have a few choices. You can select one, either you're practicing, uh, practicing energy modeler or you're part of the design team um, interfering and then working with the energy modeler. Maybe you're an owner developer who, uh, who relies on energy modeling results. Um, and, uh, and really, needs the quality. I actually don't see any poll answers come in yet. I'm not sure if you, if you guys see any. Okay. Yeah, Oliver, Eric Calder up here. I think that it was the result put up there, not the actual poll. Okay, thank you, Eric. I'm, I rely on Mike to bring up the poll. He told us not to touch anything. <laughs> okay, now I think the poll is live. Yes, here we go. And I see the blue bars coming up. So as expected, we have a lot of practicing energy models. We have a design team, um, no owner developer yet. Um, we have a few that uh, are actually modeling, model or compliance reviewers. We have software developers. We have 16% um, right now, academic and researchers, and we have a few that are on the category others. And we have 100% answered, so we can end that poll. So a little bit more than half is uh, practicing energy models. So you're exactly right here, also the design team. I think this is very interesting and important because this is the direct interaction that we have in our daily work and where it's really about um, quality control and quality assurance and, and, and the confidence that we really put into what the energy modeler presents. So we have a second um, poll. This is about your experience, how you, ex how you experience the current quality assurance, quality control process in energy modeling and we have uh, five categories, either you say, oh, that's a solid process, it's clearly defined, we have uh, control points, milestones in the process, 
or we have quality control of final results only by someone other than the energy monitor. I think that's already a good um, best practice or quality control by the energy monitor themselves. No quality control or I don't know. And we still have answers come in, but I would say this is actually pretty uh, promising. We have, okay, we have uh, completed the, the poll. You should see the results. So 40% say quality control is done by the energy modeler. Um, another 30%, so together 70% is also quality control of the final results by someone else other than the energy modeler. 9% um, say they have a, they experience a solid process um, that's clearly defined and 10% say no quality control and other 10% say they don't know. <clears throat> so that is um, kind of expected um, and a, a, a nice uh, distribution over the, well, between solid process to nothing at all, or I don't know. So there's certainly a, a good reason why we have that seminar today. So at that point, um, I would say we start with the, with the presentations and the, the statements. Uh, Maria, you go first, and I'll uh, give you the five minute um, sign. All right. So can you see my screen? Yes, we can. The okay. presenter view, I think. You might want to switch. That is correct, yeah. If you launch it, there's a button to switch presenter view somewhere. The display the, settings, maybe. Yes. The top display settings. Huh. I saw it during the practice, but not now. Maybe covered by Zoom control. Yeah, I think that's the thing. It is covered by. Someone suggesting press F5. Maybe that will work. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's what I did. Oh. <laughs> Okay, that looks good now. Okay, so, so I, I, I think I'll, so, so it should be covering both of the screens, so, so, or, or most of the screen rather, so I hope this, this is all right. It looks good, yeah. All right, so um, my presentation is focused on uh, compliance modeling, which is my area of expertise. And um, just in case of you, in case some of you are not familiar with it, uh, compliance modeling uh, involves uh, using energy simulation to demonstrate compliance with energy code beyond code programs such as LEED or utility incentive programs for new and existing buildings. Uh, my presentation focuses on performance-based compliance with ESH 90.1. So um, the standard requires developing two models. One is the model of the proposed design. Uh, the second model is virtual building that is used as point of reference for establishing performance of the proposed design. And then the re relative energy use of these two models uh, determine uh, the project need codes, uh, number, code number of lead points and uh, utility incentives. So uh, I'm gonna uh, talk about uh, an ongoing uh, DOE, PNNL, and near-funded um, research project uh, focused on uh, improving quality assurance and quality control framework for performance-based compliance. The project started in 2019 and is ongoing. Uh, it was informed by um, a uh, very comprehensive uh, stakeholder group. Uh, we have um, over 27 jurisdictions from across the country and also Canada, 
nine um, uh, above code programs uh, that, uh, that, that they will have with the lead, EPA and the GSTA multifamily high rise, uh, various utility incentive programs. We have software to vendors. Uh, we have um, members of relevant standards committees, including standard 90.1, 140, uh, 189, 209, and then representatives of um, various relevant third party organizations such as Comnet, ResNet, uh, of course, Ibipsa, uh, New Building Institute, and so forth. So, what you see on this slide is short term priorities uh, relevant to model QAQC identified by stakeholders. As you can see, um, Half of stakeholders felt that um, the most burning need is to have the standardized um, reporting format that would facilitate um, submit reviews. Uh, Twenty percent uh, felt that having submit review checklist is the top priority. Uh, Ten percent felt that it's very important to have. Um, modular qualification requirements established, and then 7% um, uh, wanted to have uh, submit a review manual developed. And um, the DOE PNL research project addressed uh, all of these top priorities, and I will talk about the tools developed um, and already available that address these needs. So I want to just have um, say a few words about long-term priorities identified by stakeholders, and um, uh, the the first uh, the, the top the most stakeholders rather felt that uh, it is important to uh, improve automation of performance-based compliance by developing uh, compliance shells within software tools that would uh, automatically generate models of the baseline and proposed design following the rules of the uh, modeling protocol, such as uh, standard 90.1 Appendix G. 27% um, uh, felt that it's important to have national network of uh, accredited modelers. Uh, same goes uh, for national network of accredited reviewers and then um, many felt that it's not enough for the software to just implement the compliance shells, that there has to be a certification program to verify that these implementations are uh, true to the underlying standard rules. And I'm um, very excited by the new eBIPSA initiative to um, investigate pathways for eBIPSA uh, to become certifying body for uh, software tools, modelers, and reviewers. So, but now I want to uh, get a little bit deeper into um, uh, the tools that were developed. So the first tool is uh, the compliance form. So it's a, a spreadsheet based form. It supports 90.1, 2016 and 2019, section 11 and appendix G. Uh, it meets uh, reporting requirements of standard 90.1. It uh, allows importing simulation results from uh, common uh, simulation tools, uh, including Design Build, Energy Plus, Equest, Train Trace, 3D, and 700, and Open Studio. So we worked with uh, software developers of these tools to incorporate this functionality. Uh, it uh, automates compliance calculations based on the modeling results, and it includes quality assurance checks tab to facilitate submit the reviews. So the form is posted on- uh, Maria, just a gentle yep. reminder, we passed the five minute mark. Okay, yeah, almost done. <laughs> so um, uh, the form is posted on GOE website and uh, we also have it customized for Seattle and uh, New York City because these uh, jurisdictions uh, adopted uh, several amendments to uh, ASHRAE protocols and uh, the form, the custom version of the compliance form to support lead and EPA energy star program uh, and development. And then the second tool that I wanna cover is uh, submit a review manual. Um, it is a companion to uh, compliance form also posted on uh, GA website. Um, it includes a comprehensive list of submit a review checks, model review checks, uh, and on the right of the slide, you see a table of uh, contents uh, of the review manual. And um, the, for, for each check, there is a generic description of how, 
how to implement the check. And then uh, there are also uh, uh, sections with uh, annotated simulation reports in common uh, software tools that illustrate where in the simulation reports you can find information necessary to complete individual checks. And again, we worked with the software vendors to develop these reports. And submit a review manual, target audience include jurisdiction and rating authorities, uh, submit the reviewers and uh, energy modelers. So uh, there are sections within the manual specifically targeting this uh, different user groups. And uh, finally, I wanna mention that uh, in my opinion, there is no uh, one size fits all QAQC protocol. So it has to be uh, tailored to the model end use uh, and uh, model use case, you know, whether it's um, the, 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 uh, the result of energy modeling is meant to be predictive of actual uh, energy use of the building. Uh, is it the model that's used um, for compliance analysis? And there is new binational Canada and US uh, modeling standard being developed uh, that um, describes uh, QAQC practices appropriate for each different use cases. And uh, I included some references of the materials uh, to, to the uh, materials that I covered here on the last slide. Okay, excellent. Th thank you, Maria, that, that will be shared with everyone. And we move on with John. Okay, can you see that? I still see Maria's screen. Maria, can you stop sharing? Okay, now John, you're up. Okay, so um, I'm the guy with lots of different hats. And at the moment I'm being my paranoid consultant set and developer. So I use simulation to understand the performance well enough to actually tell somebody else a really good story about their design. That means I need to actually get in there and sort out what in the world's going on with this thing. Um, so that we get beyond the standard sort of reports. Um, so I really want to tell a story that's robust. I really want to deliver useful insights. And um, so I've spent a rather long time evolving tools uh, to deliver, help deliver those robust stories. Um, I am easily frustrated by the tools I use. And happily, I'm in the position of actually going in and I can go and change the software, recompile and get new facilities in to meet the needs of whatever the current project is or the, you know, that sort of stuff. So um, let's start a story about, of all things, brack wax figures in the Victoria and Albert Museum. Long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, um, was asked, uh, somebody wanted to make a, a uh, exhibition of wax figures in the Victoria Alberts, and it was scheduled for the summer. And somebody asked the question, how many hours do we have if the environmental controls fail during this hot summer week? How many hours do we have before these artifacts are at risk? These are one of a kind things. They get lost, there's no replacement for it. So no pressure. We all agreed, nobody knew the answer to this. They commissioned three different assessment teams to go and look at it. And um, so really pedantic discovery about what is the nature of this thing we're trying to assess? Really looking at it um, and then saying, okay. And then uh, so we really wanted to understand the essence of what we wanted to simulate. How often in practice do we actually do that? Pedantic review of the thermophysics in play, really imagining what kinds of things are going on here so that we made an informed selection of the tools and solvers we're using, rather than just saying, hey, I'm doing a good job because I've ticked every box that the tool offers. So we wanted to design our model so that we really captured the essential characteristics of it. So it's, to me, how much detail is actually needed to answer the question? Where is it that that detail needs to be placed? Um, and so how much the building actually needs to be modeled to answer the client's question? 
Can I design assessments to capture unintended consequences? For example, can I identify patterns of boundary conditions and renew use that, that are very useful to explore to understand the nature of the building? Can I toss some gremlins into the assessment that randomly fault different kinds of things in the building to illuminate points of failure? So beliefs, design teams have all kinds of beliefs how stuff works. A few, some of those beliefs actually be true, but we can use simulation to test these beliefs. We could use simulation to explore the robustness of the design. Now to the crux of it, people running simulation have all kinds of beliefs themselves. Beliefs about their tools, beliefs about their working practices, beliefs about their model making abilities. And again, some of those beliefs are actually true. What well, I submit that there are many practitioners who are actually quite poor observers of what actually is happening in buildings. Many practitioners place an unfounded trust in their tools. It didn't blow up. Therefore, it must be right. Many practitioners believe that compliance equates to a delightful place to live or work. Compliance is for a specific purpose. You go and read the fine print on lots of compliance tools and they say, please, this was not designed, it's not intended to be used as a design tool. So one antidote for unfounded belief is QAQC. Helps us gain confidence that our models are fit for purpose, that our working practices have the possibility to deliver useful information, and the biggie is without us having staff casualties along the way. It forces us out of our comfort zone. It makes explicit our modeling goals. It encourages us to document and defend our assumptions. It encourages the discovery of unintended consequences of the design process. And when we discover those unintended confidence, uh, consequences, I treat it as this is a preview of opportunities to make the design better. I found something while I was exploring this thing and all of a sudden I can report to the client, hey, we weren't contracted to do that, but here's something we noticed along the way. And so, and of course, QA, QC is about catching the usual suspects. John, we did pass the five minute mark. We actually had okay. the six minute mark. Okay, fine. So model fit for purpose might be more or less complex than the easy paths that tools provide. Let's start small and high resolution. Everything in this thing is thermally active. It's actually real radiation view factors. Everything, there is paper in the cabinets, uh, books on the shelves, sensors at each uh, point, uh, each workstation on there. That's a small portion of, a, of an office building, but I can answer lots and lots of questions from that. So let's create models that work for the employees uh, of that company. Let's go below in compliance and have assessments that essentially run forever. It, you start it and it just keeps tossing out random gremlins to see how a building might fail its occupants. And then when it finds a failure, that's what we'd like to do about it. So to make it work better, it starts before your fingers hit the keyboard. I'm not getting my go forward thing. Okay, uh, name stuff. So you own the model. Don't assume some magic button will support the creation of delightful spaces. Admit that compliance tools sometimes make rubbish design tools. It's a team thing. Get your colleagues to look over your shoulder. My big thing is spend a lot of time living with your model so that you understand the beastie, get proficient at scanning the model contents reports, pester vendors to make those reports better and physically test the building and its digital twin before you hand the thing over. Here's an example of a thing I did, yes, uh, a couple of days ago. Uh, basically, I'd there was an old building that was monitored. I made a digital twin of it. 
I embedded that monitoring into the model and tried out different kinds of things that were slightly unknown uh, in order to figure out what was going on. And that, oh, John, we um, eight minutes. That's it. Okay, excellent. Okay. Thank you so much. Let me stop and, the share. Okay. Right, and we move on with Colleen. All right, uh, so I'm up next, starting, hopefully you can see my screen. So at HKS, we've attempted to train architects and designers who are interested um, in the energy modeling process to put the basics together and make an early phase energy model. And those models are really going to be looking just at building envelope energy efficiency measures. And the real goal is to inform massing, orientation, glazing, and then the building's envelope thermal performances. And there's definitely unique issues that arise in trying to teach, um, you know, kind of a newbie how to, how to do energy modeling as a process. And kind of the other spectrum to look at um, at our firm is, you know, how do we hand, um, hand the QIQC of a model done by a third party consultant um, when the expectation is that they are the expert, they know more than the architects in terms of energy modeling, and the architect is generally not equipped to catch some of the errors that the consultant might be making in their process. You know, and the outcomes of that can really impact our permitting schedule and the client goals. And so in uh, bringing the QAQC to the energy modeling process of the architect or designer, um, that's really where I think a lot of the preparation comes, you know, like John said, before you even start the model, but this is even going back to school and learning some of those basics. Uh, so at our firm, we've put together an early phase energy modeling training course that does teach the basics um, to people who are maybe just being exposed to these concepts for the first time. And so I've pulled out in the text box um, some of the key points in the outline of that training. So like the first item is the 2030 commitment, which as an architecture firm, it's our industry's way of holding ourselves accountable to a carbon neutral portfolio by 2030. Uh, but then we do dig into, you know, building metrics, benchmarking tools, climate zones, thermal bridging, R value, U value, um, some of those things that I think people on the call may think is natural and intuitive, but for a newcomer may not be the case. And then the second part of our training module, once we get past kind of that front loading of information is a script, a scripted workflow that really establishes how you would do an early phase energy model properly. Um, if we didn't have this workflow, um, I think we were seeing a lot of times an architect might just run one model and be like, this is my performance. Um, but we had to kind of create a script where you set them up to set a benchmark, explore massing options, run a baseline model from which you can actually iterate and evaluate energy efficiency measures from. Um, and we really found that that energy modeling process, um, you know, it became a lot more robust and the architects were starting to see that if you made one small change, what that would do to your EUI. And so one of the key parts of this, this kind of scripted workflow that we've created is an appendix so we can, um, we have, I guess, a kind of a dummies book for energy modeling, but we're trying to translate per climate zone what values needed to be entered as an input to this baseline energy model. Um, our firm wide goal is that um, regardless of the jurisdiction that all our projects should be designing to the latest uh, energy standard out there. Uh, so that's kind of what we use in our in appendix. Um, but we like we really show them that, you know, this is the rated R value, the U value, assembly R value, which I think most people on this call would argue is not a real thing, but there are softwares that ask for that input. So we try to make an appendix that allows the translation of actual building physics data into an energy modeling software. And so in our workflow, we also have guidance um, for possible ranges to study in the building envelope. Um, we were finding without those guardrails, we would be seeing people exploring impossible uh, thermal performance values in their model. So we wanted to you know, put a range on some of the things that were studied in the parametrics. Uh, and then this is just the final step um, was creating like an automated worksheet for the, the firm 
So we have consistent graphics and reports. Um, that way, you know, I would say it's, it's, I think one of the more confusing things is having output reports from a variety of softwares with different graphs. And so this way we're creating a consistent standard that if they can understand one project's graphs in our portfolio, then they'll be able to understand um, how the design is being influenced across all the projects in our firm um, by seeing all these different reports. And then finally, I just have this one slide here focusing back on that second scenario of reviewing a third party's models. Um, so I have to admit, it's not a robust QA QC process at this time, but so many projects at the firm were not always engaged when a consultant does an energy model. Uh, usually we're just brought to the table when something goes wrong. And that means a lead review that has a ton of review comments, a permit process being delayed, or just having a prior history of intensive code reviews in that jurisdiction is kind of a red flag. And so what we need to be better at is having someone well-versed in energy modeling, review the energy model reports at every milestone and having a kickoff with that team to make sure they're on the using the right compliance path and modeling methodology. Um, and that they also have a conversation. So we know the modeling that's being done is answering the questions that actually are gonna influence the design and matter. Um, so I put a little snip on. Carly, we be past the six minute mark. Okay. Um, I put a little snip on the right of an example of an executive summary we received from a third party modeler. Uh, I thought it was really funny um, and sad, but they're claiming to be modeling for code compliance with ASHRAE 90.1 2013 Appendix G, which is a viable path if they were using the addendum BM. Um, but then you see they're not talking about performance cost index, so they're not doing that. But then they go back in and re refer back to IECC language and having an 85% um, cost or less cost savings. So there's so many things wrong in that one summary. Um, thankfully, this was caught in 50% CDs, but you know this this might fly under the radar depending on your AHJ. AHJ. Um, so in my perspective, if we can't trust the modeler to understand the nuances of some of these code compliance paths, how can we trust the proper modeling procedures even being followed as they're doing their modeling? Um, so I just hope others can kind of you know find that little snip entertaining. Um, but I'm excited to hand it off to Greg, who I'm sure is going to offer some more great insights about how consultants can, you know, avoid some of these pitfalls that we find in energy modeling. Okay, thank you very much, Colleen. And Greg, it's your turn. All right. <clears throat> um, cool. I will jump right in, try to get us back on track a little bit time-wise. Um, so th this is our, uh, my, my colleagues. Um, and I actually realized uh, a little while ago that the kind of four different examples of some of the work that we're doing that helps us with QAQC uh, is done by each of my four colleagues. Um, so thanks, thanks to you guys, those that can make it here today. Um, and we're kind of, we're all remote. So you see we're all over the place, small growing team, um, which is super exciting. But um, the first thing, um, Hopefully most of you are on board with this, but we, we've done like a lot of utility incentive reviews in, in California. And I know there are still a couple energy modeling tools that are not 3D yet, but like, I think the easiest thing to do um, to ensure quality model geometries is do 3D modeling. Um, so we're hundred percent, we have been for, I, I don't know how long, uh, I guess as long as our company has been in existence, but you can just see like, the complexities this is one of uh, Yi's models, uh, but you can see the complexity of geometry and shading and angles and things like that, that how the heck could you model that in two dimension? Um, and I think in, you know, over time, like you can, you could in theory be as accurate with 2D, but I think as a process in, in application and in consulting, like we're doing iterative modeling. So to be able to like, import and overlay the new architectural drawings on your model. You can see if something's moved and doesn't match up anymore and just kind of jump in where in 2D mode, you're like redoing PDF takeoffs uh, every time there's a design update. 
And then a really cool thing too is this helps on constructions and assignments. So I'm sure it's hard to read, but this is the same model obviously, but we're just visualizing the assigned constructions uh, as color coded like on those surfaces. So as a QAQC step, you can QAQC you know, your own model as the modeler. It makes it really easy for me to QAQC. I just open the model, look at this thing, and I can see it makes sense. We can also share this in reports with our clients and they can have more confidence in what we're doing because they can see it um, and don't have to question and do area takeoffs and, and things like that to like make sure our stuff adds up. Um, and, and one other thing that kind of came up uh, in team discussion the other day is like, this is as an energy modeler, it's so much more enjoyable and fulfilling to like build this rather than a, a 2D geometry. So just like, you know, if you like what you do, it's, it's gonna be better quality naturally. Um, so the next kind of theme I have is just quality through consistency. Um, so I'll show you like not our whole kind of suite of tools, but uh, an example and then how we're kind of evolving if you're kind of looking ahead over here. But, but basically we have like our, our EM inputs or energy model inputs like workbook that has, you know, helps us track information um, and so this is something like Jackson in particular on our team has put a lot of time into automating um, like the baseline lookup. So this is the top is again, probably hard to read, but we're, we can kind of put in the proposed design and you can see a little bit. We have like notes off the side about, oh, this came from Chris on the 17th. Um, and, you know, we'll, we'll define that, but then the, the two baselines that we have, cause you know, we're California, we're doing code compliance and lead modeling and using separate baselines to do that. This stuff's all automated. Um, and then we have something similar on internal gains and I'm showing here that we're kind of, this is a workbook, but we're copying, copying and pasting data in and out of our modeling tool of choice. Um, two, two directions, right? So that's helping us automate things that you would do a little bit more manually in the modeling software. And then what's nice about this method is like you have a nicely formatted table that's always the same, it's consistent, and we can dump that right in a report and send that to clients. Um, so they can kind of see all, all the, the, the details. Um, and a, a note on kind of our evolution. So spreadsheets, in PDFs, um, we're still using that a lot, but in the past couple years, um, we've been jumping on the Python bandwagon uh, pretty seriously. And so we're building a suite of things. I'll show you a couple of quick examples, but if you're not there yet, um, you know, definitely take a look. I, I think spreadsheets and PDFs are, you know, gonna be uh, way behind us pretty quickly and in, in the power that you have uh, is pretty amazing. And so again, you know, we use ISVE, which has a Python integration in, in API. So we're kind of going back and forth with that data. And then we're not quite there yet, but we're starting to like kind of launch, uh, launch some of the tools we're building uh, on, on, a, on the World Wide Web on, on the internet. Um, so I'm gonna jump out of PowerPoint and show you an example of, of something my colleague Madeline is, is working on. And she joined us like just over a month ago. Um, and so she's already taken a bunch of Python courses that a that, um, few of us have already taken. And so this, the, the kind of question was um, just kind of putting like a data analysis hat on, um, you know, we're doing lighting power density takeoffs or lighting power takeoffs. And how do you QAQC that? And so she's working on writing, you know, some Python code in a Jupyter notebook. And I think this, there are a few cool graphics in here, but just the power of what you can do when it's not like a boring table in a PDF or a spreadsheet um, is pretty awesome. And all this is free, free libraries. Um, so I'm excited about kind of integrating this. This is kind of prototyping and we'll, we'll integrate it into our our tools and processes. So you're in your modeling software, click a button and you get a report with a bunch of graphics and you can just take a look. Um, and then on the result side, this is something that's been in the works for a while as well. Um, so my colleague Rara has been working on this starting with her internship last year. And then she just joined us full-time uh, this month. 
but this is just um, probably a little out of time to show a demo, but basically I can just drag and drop a couple files. Like we wrote a script that kicks the hourly in use data out of ISVE into a couple of CSV files, drag and drop it. And then it's showing you visualizations that we have in a spreadsheet. Um, we had in a Tableau um, software dashboard, but Python, it's like this, this is in, you know, the browser. And so we have this hosted, this is kind of a local version, but the, the idea is soon uh, we'll, you know, we'll finish a modeling iteration and we'll send an executive summary to our clients, some appendices that we're kind of kicking out all of the detailed information, and then we'll send a link. So here's the data. Um, you can change the units, you can kind of filter, you can zoom in on the area of interest um, and things like that. And you can see where the savings are and you can interrogate it and you can build your own dashboard. Great, um, we are beyond to seven minutes. Okay. Um, I lied, I guess, about trimming the time. Um, but I, I think that was it for me. We do have, we have one video on our YouTube channel, um, but we'll have more in the near future. Like once this becomes shareable, we want to kind of make that available for people, other people to play around with. Um, but yeah, that's it for me. If you can, I can drop my, drop my email address in the, in the chat as well. So thanks. Okay. Well, Thank you very much to all the, the panelists. I think we had we heard excellent statements. Um, we have a few questions, and please let them keep coming in through the through the chat. Um, I tried to go through them as they came in. Um, there was one question at the beginning to, to all panelists: How important is the professional certification? of the model in the quality control, quality assurance process. And I would like to address that question maybe to Kyleen and, and, and Greg as, as the practitioners. How, how important do you think is the certification, the accreditation to you or also to your clients? I can start. I mean, I, I think just because you have a certification, it doesn't mean your model's foolproof. Um, but I do think it's important that there's that entry bar that is setting some type of standard in our industry, much like a structural engineer would need to be, you know, a PE in structural engineering to stamp off on drawings. I think it's important that, you know, having a BEMP or some other type of somewhat recognized certification is important to get your foot in the door. Um, I agree with all that. I, I, I think, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't ensure quality just because somebody has a credential. Um, but I think, yeah, some kind of minimum level, it, it raises the bar and, and shows that you're serious about the profession. Um, so yeah, I, I took the BEMP exam a few years ago and I thought that was a pretty good exam. Um, yeah. And a follow up question. Oh, go ahead, Marie. If, if I can chime in quickly, I, I agree. I think it's it's critically important to require these certifications, and I hope uh, more uh, beyond code programs, more jurisdictions will require such certifications from the modelers because uh, without really taking certification test, modeler himself or herself, you know, that doesn't know how they how good they are. So it's a way to judge your own skills and also. No, the way to elevate the industry. Uh, and uh, we have many people now uh, participating in this um, event. So I encourage all of you take a shot at BAMP exam because sometimes there is a little chicken and egg issue where we're trying to encourage jurisdictions to start requiring BAMP. And they're telling us, look, there is not enough BAMPs in the country. So uh, it, 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 that's, that's actually leads to, to a follow-up question because uh, what kind of professional qualifications are they out for energy models? We heard about them, the, the building energy model professional, that's a, an ASHRAE um, accreditation. Um, Alan uh, May mentioned AEE used to have a certification building energy simulation analyst, but they're not doing that anymore. Uh, I, I'm not very familiar with that. What what? certifications, relevant certifications for building energy monitors are out there? I know C California has has one. Um, 
that honestly I'm not a big fan of, but the certified energy analyst for like California compliance, um, which the, I think the intent is great, but it's like they only offer in-person exams. They're very infrequent. There's a couple of cities that have adopted it as a requirement, um, but like there aren't enough. And I guess uh, one of you just mentioned that Maria or Oliver, sorry, I forget like about not wanting to adopt it yet because there aren't enough. Um, and also that's like a more kind of residential focus. So again, I'm a fan of, of credentialing, um, but you know, with, within reason and it's, it's not like necessarily the one thing that, that, that should be done. I think a, a better thing would, or would a supplemental thing that could help ensure you're getting somebody that's qualified is if more. I guess architects or owners would just be asking for resumes of the energy modeler that's going to work on their project rather than just have them be kind of lumped into the MEP design team or, or something like that, like specific focus on the person and, and the profession really. Okay. Thank you. And uh, Eric uh, actually uh, posted something in the uh, chat about the IBIPSA USA certification committee. Um, and uh, certification process is being the, uh, established by Eclipse. And I think that's just the right thing and necessary. Um, we have uh, another question. How does one reconcile these two things? One, performance software accurately reflects energy use. Two, various energy modeling software will have significant different results. Anyone, John, do you want to jump on that? Um, second opinions are actually quite a useful sort of thing. Um, sometimes we, uh, because we've got two legs, we use two legs for everything. Some people, you know, hey, they're good at CFD. So they throw CFD at every possible thing. Um, so I do think that uh, having a, a team that's large enough that potentially can use multiple tools, uh, then they can, you know, pick and choose potentially get a, a second opinion is a good thing to have. It's hard to do that as a, as a solo operator, uh, but you know, if you've got a two team, multiple people, multiple tools, that's healthy. Okay, thank you. Next question. I haven't found a clear path to model windows between the two following options. One, is it recommended to model the actual size and locations? This could be the best option as some shading and framing can impact the simulation as reality, but this method is time confused, uh, consuming. Two, model the window to wall ratio. This method will be faster and, did, and in the software that I use, which is Design Builder, it's possible to change that parameter to create different scenarios. What about accuracy? I have an opinion on that, but what, who, who wants to go on that? Yeah, I, I'm happy to. To start, I, I would say depends on what you're doing. I'd say either of those like fast is way better in some scenarios, right? And if, if you can get more results um, in that the actual placement in, in exact shading um, aren't as important right now, especially when like most software assumes if you're not doing CFD, every all the air in the room is thoroughly mixed anyway. So exactly where the window is may not matter. Um, but, but if you're like zooming in and doing a detailed, I don't know, facade optimization study and looking at daylight, then you need to spend more time on accurate, you know, sp spatial, um, factors. I, th I think it also goes back to what John mentioned in his presentation. You really have to understand your, your model, uh, your, your software. What does this software do with that accuracy? Does it actually use that accuracy to... To, to create results or is it blended into something um, more, more general? And um, so the, I yeah. think this, this is a very important aspect, John. Did you... uh, what's the nature of the question that the client is actually asking for about, are they, are they actually concerned about what it's like inside the space? Uh, which is what tends to drive the, the, the uh, research and, and consulting that happens in, in the UK is that it's really, yeah, fine, the accountants are interested in the total energy use of the year, but the people that work in there and the companies that want their people to be more productive say, hey, 
we want to know how good our environment is inside and if there are going to be some issues there we may be wanting to future proof our building try out some different scenarios then you start rolling in that but start simple small focused you know you could do one or two offices and find out an answer to a question you know why in the world would anybody want to do a hundred zone model or a thousand zone model as the first thing they did you know and to ch chime in with um, uh, compliance modeling perspective, the, the level of detail that must be captured is prescribed in the standard in many cases. So it's not up to the modeler oftentimes to figure it out. And uh, like, e even if we happen to disagree with the required level of detail, the only recourse is to uh, submit uh, a yeah. continuous maintenance proposal to 90 I believe the client takes precedence over the standard. If the client really needs to know that, they need to do move beyond move beyond the compliance stuff. John, but it's a different. So I talk about use cases. You, your client may want to evaluate like daylighting, evaluate comfort. But, but then in addition to that, your client may want to document compliance with energy code or get lead points. Yeah. So this is a separate yeah. use case. My concern is the people that stop only with compliance and, and don't go out of their comfort zone to, to look at these other things when the tools are quite capable of delivering this additional information. Yes, okay. not only um, but different use cases. We're, we're getting close to the full hour. I would actually propose to extend that discussion for another five minutes or so. We have a couple more questions if that's okay with the panelists and um, I assume the audience, whoever wants to stay on can stay on. Um, so. Justin Lurker has a question. How can we verify that all our hard work perfecting geometry, envelope inputs, et cetera, does not go out the window because of a single, perhaps not well understood HVAC control input? We design in lots of little reality checks. You know, you, you come up with scenarios where you, kind of have a good imagination of how a building will respond to something or other. And you, you test it out over a very short period of time to see if that kind of thing's happening. And then you have another scenario to test another thing. So lots of little bites into the thing to, to build up your confidence in the model. Yeah, I would like to add to, to that as well. So my background, I started almost 30 years ago as an energy modeler. And I started modeling without seeing 3D geometries and after about one year of energy modeling, um, one of our construction administrators, supervisors, came to me and said, he wants me to be on that construction site because I, I'm supposed to understand how everything works. So that's how, that was my introduction to commissioning. And I combined throughout my career energy modeling and commissioning. And one thing that I really try to do in, in my practice on a daily basis is have the energy modeler have a significant part in the design review because they need to review the design anyways and make sure all the details are specified and, and actually available and all the information. But then also have the commissioning engineer review the energy model and the results if they make sense from a performance and operational uh, standpoint. So this is our, our approach and, and really I carry a thermographic camera around with me all the time when I go on site visits. <laughs> Colleen, you wanted to add something to it. Yeah, I would just, I think one of the hot tips I learned early in my career was never run an annual simulation when you're still playing around with mechanical controls. So if we're testing a mixed mode operation system, you know, run a, run a week or something like that. And then you can start to dig into the out, outputs and then see that it's working or not. Carlene, we have a specific question to you. Could you elaborate on what else is wrong with that paragraph from third party energy modeler other than mixing the code compliance paths? And with code compliance, there's a, a whole side conversation going on in the chat. I'm not elaborating on that. You can read that here, but Carlene, can you answer that question? Yeah, I did try to answer in the chat and I know I think it's getting a little heated there, but um, I guess for me, they're, they're calling out ASHRAE 90.1 and IECC within the same sentence but referring to two different compliance paths like you're just mixing compliance paths at that point which is not okay and then for them to say they're going with the appendix g model in in 2013 
and they're still just referencing energy cost savings, that's impossible. You can't, you can't do that. Um, so just, uh, if you dig in the history of the chat, hopefully you'll see some of the back and forths about that topic. Okay, then um, Eric had a question. Can you have any confidence in a model without reviewing lots of time step variable reports to make sure systems are working as expected? Uh, I, I guess the, the, the way I would recommend approaching it is to look at uh, high level uh, outputs such as uh, uh, energy use intensity for the building, uh, uh, energy use profile, uh, variation in energy consumption uh, from month to month. And then uh, if um, it doesn't look right, and of course, determining that takes experience, dig deeper into looking at the hourly results. And also if you are exploring, um, if you're modeling certain control strategy, uh, again, in this case, I would, typically look at hourly results to confirm that it's working as expected. But I would again start with higher level simulation results uh, because there is so, so, so much you can dig into, you, you have to prioritize. Yeah, I, I think- I would was, Go ahead, Rick. Oh, I, I, I would agree. I, I think like you can gain some confidence like you should but I think it depends on how confident you want to be. And you, you can't be very confident without looking more at like, you know, histograms or frequency of things or like kind of the average uh, daily profile of energy consumption and things like that. And I think that's like, I think data need, and I think somebody said in the chat, like you, you need to have 8760 data at some point, you don't only need to look at like giant spreadsheets of all that data, but if you start there, you can simplify and, and have some graphics that kind of just you can glance at and, and you get an understanding. I think that's where we need to go as an industry is like leverage, leverage that data. Greg, I have a follow-up question for you from the chat. Could you recommend the Python data visualization courses and or other learning reference that your team utilizes? And I know you, yeah. you gave a seminar just a few weeks ago. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, so Eric Kolder, if I think dropped the link in the chat to the recording of um, the IBIPSA USA kind of recent webinar, but Clay Clayton Miller at National University of Singapore has an edX course um, that I would highly recommend. Um, so it's uh, data science for construction architecture engineering, I think, and if you, don't know Python, if you're not familiar, like you can kind of get by through that course, but um, our team, everybody's taking like an intro to Python course first, just to get the fundamentals. And then you'll be really well prepared for, for that course, which is AEC industry specific. So that's kind of those two courses, I would say, you know, e easy recommendation. Okay, thank you. And I, I'll ask now the, the last question for today. Uh, John, any recommendation or reference materials for energy models? Where do you think most energy models go wrong? Okay, I, I came up with basically a, a, a book about focusing on the strategy of designing simulation models. We should be in charge of doing that. Now, I can't, I was looking for my link for the thing so I could paste it in, but I don't have that. So essentially what I'll do is I'll type my email address in, into the thing and the people that are interested in that, I'll see if I can, I can, I can find that. But basically, I think we, we need strategies to drive the process, strategies to answer particular kinds of questions, to, to help us decide uh, how far we want to go and what, you know, and, and the reality check we need to put in there. Um, so yeah, uh, yes, a lot of it is get to know your tool, um, find out the stuff that the vendor has hidden from you. A lot of tools hide an awful lot of assumptions. If we could just pry that open, uh, you know, we would have a whole lot better job of, of focusing our models on what we really were trying to answer. Um, so, uh, I'll go ahead and type mm -hmm. my email in here and okay. people can contact me. Thanks, Ben. At that point, I would like to say thank you to all the panelists. I think that was excellent. Also, as a follow-up, I saw some comments about the more detailed uh, conversation and the discussion really go deeper. Um, that is actually the intention. So that whole 
uh, conversation about quality control and quality assurance uh, started with a survey that the education committee um, did last year. We have now that, that uh, panel discussion. And I feel like uh, the BIPSA USA and the community really is ready to tackle that issue and standardize um, quality control, quality assurance processes and have a, a, a process, have metrics, have, have control metrics uh, ready so that not just the monitors, but also the industry that uses our services is confident and really can make confident decisions because we, we're uh, not just talking about code compliance, which is very important and has a, a very clear purpose of assuring quality of the, of the built environment. But we talk more and more about um, high performance buildings, net zero energy buildings will be the, the standard in our industry tomorrow, basically. We need to get ready to have carbon neutral facilities. At that point, we cannot um, like, agree on like a plus minus 20% failure rate in our in our predictions that we do. And I think we all as an industry have a responsibility to take that serious and to work on that. So with that, I will uh, share a couple final housekeeping um, things. So our um, presentation, our seminar today um, concludes with, with this. Um, if you are interested in seeing more of those webinar seminars, become a member of EBIPSA USA, join our education committee or, or other committees. And we have other webinars coming up on August 24, August 26, September 30. And we will have uh, more in the, in the near future and, and uh, more long-term future. And with that, again, thank you to all our panelists. Ex excellent job. And I'll see you all very soon somewhere. Thank you. And Oliver, are you going to save the chat so that we can kind of see the, the comments? I'll try to do that. I stopped the recording now.